So, um, and thank you to the Leakey Foundation, also for the Cal California Academy of Sciences. It's just a, it's always fun to come out to California, although I kind of worry every time I come out here because it's so nice here. Um, it makes me realize um, just how impoverished we are back on the East Coast in terms of weather and climate and all kinds of Chinese food and everything. It's just, um, it's not fair, but there we are. Can't have everything. So um, I would like to, um, to address um, the story of the human body. Um, for, and, but let me start with a little bit of context, which is that a lot of the research that happens in human evolution addresses the fundamental question, what is it that happened in our evolutionary history, right? So there's a lot of research, uh, for example, research that Zarai and his colleagues are doing to discover fossils so that we understand what is the family tree of the humans. When and why did we become bipedal? When did we get big brains? When did we start speaking, you know, um, start throwing, all those sorts of things that are important to us. And, and finally, what sort of forces shaped our evolutionary question? These are the fundamental sort of bread and Better questions in human evolution. But there's another set of questions that often don't get asked as much and that I'd like to also talk about today, which is how is the evolution of our bodies actually relevant to the kinds of challenges and problems that we face today? How are our bodies still evolving today? What does it mean to have bodies that are from the Stone Age that are <clears throat> in the Space Age world? And how can studying evolution help us chart a better future for our bodies? And so I want to address that, that duality of questions today in this lecture. So we'll begin with uh, what happened in human evolution. And here's a picture of Louis uh, Leakey with some of the skulls and where, where they might fit on the tree. And, um, and you know, there are a lot of people who spend their entire lives just trying to figure out what's the correct family tree of humans and what name to put all these fossils. And, and I don't want to sound too much like a heretic, but I'm going to be a little bit of a heretic today and say that, yes, although this is important, I'll make a bet that for the vast majority of us in this room, just which bar and which line these things go to probably doesn't matter all that much to most of us. I mean, it's interesting to know, but how really important is it actually? I mean, because uh, we want to know well, how and why our bodies are the way they are. And actually, I, the exhibit here at the end of the, of the hallway, I think, is a wonderful exhibit because it focuses not so much on the trees, but on the forest. And with a big forest question, if you ask me, about what happened to make our bodies the way they are, can actually be boiled down to five major transformations that occurred since we split from the chimpanzees uh, around uh, the chimpanzee lineage around approximately six million years ago, give or take a few million years. And so let me very briefly go through those five major transformations before we switch. I'll try. I'm a kind of a, I got a lot to say and I'm a fast speaker, so I'll do my best. So we, we have uh, five major transformations that occurred uh, over the last uh, five or six million years, and let me just go for them very briefly. Now the first one, was the transition from, um, from the chimpanzee lim lineage to the first hominins. And, and we have a bunch of species. There's, they're called Salanthropus and Artipithecus and Auroran. And the important thing about these species is that they're basically, they were bipeds. And we have evidence that their necks went vertically down. They had slightly smaller canines. Their, their pelvises and their feet all give us evidence that these creatures were basically bipeds. And they, they walked upright. Although they didn't walk upright quite like you and me, they were sort of occasional bipeds, or what we call sometimes faculty of bipeds. The second big switch, see we're going real fast here, the second big switch started around four million years ago when there was a radiation, explosion of hominin species, which we collectively call the Australopiths. And these were a little bit more uh, advanced in some ways than those earlier hominins. They had bigger faces, they had cheek teeth that were really large and thick and big. They had smaller canines, they had modern knees and, and feet that were basically well designed for walking more or less the way you and I walk. Um, and there was a big radiation. And, and these creatures, if you ask me, what's really important about them is that these were the first creatures that weaned us off a diet that was primarily a fruit. They started eating underground storage organs and other sort of mechanically demanding foods like, like roots and tubers, for example. They were better at walking long distances and they, they were less arboreal and lived in more open habitats. Very important transformation in our evolution. You can see that they're becoming more like us. Maybe the biggest transformation of all, the one that's maybe the, the had the most extraordinary implications for us today is the origins of the human genus that started around uh, two and a half million years ago. And there is a huge suite of features that changed at that time. Brains get slightly bigger. We lost um, our snouts and we got external noses, which are 
very useful for holding our glasses, for example. Um, our teeth got very small. Um, we, our shoulders got lower and wider, and our thorax got a modern shape as opposed to that conical shape that you see in chimpanzees. Our waist became narrow. Our, fore, our arms became shorter. Our legs became longer. We started getting an arch in our feet, a uh, full arch with a lot of spring mechanism in it and short toes. Lots of things changed with the origins of the genus Homo. And if you stand back from all those little anatomical details, what really matters for you and us? Well, it's really that it was the invention of the hunting and gathering way of life. We see that we have people, we're gathering a wide range of plants, but we also started hunting animals um, and scavenging. Typical hunter-gatherers will walk between 9 and 15 kilometers a day. They carry foods, they dig things, they, they throw things, they climb as well still. Um, but they're making tools, they're processing their food, and maybe most importantly, they became intensely cooperative. This is a way of life that persisted until extremely recently and was really invented by the first members of the genus Homo. And we are the way we are today in large part because of the invention of hunting and gathering. Now the fourth transformation was really an elaboration of that hunting and gathering way of life in which we got so good at it that our brains started getting bigger and our bodies became large and, and much more like uh, people today. In fact, if you were to meet uh, one of these archaic humans, such as a Neanderthal, they'd basically be like you from the neck down, and they're different. the only really serious differences between, between you and a Neanderthal is from the neck up. And um, what these people are really are better hunter-gatherers. They, they invented sophisticated tools like putting points on the ends of spears, and they started cooking their food much more regularly. And, and all of this gave humans much more energy. It was like an energetic revolution. And that enabled us to do several things. One of them is it enabled us to start breeding faster. So a typical chimpanzee and probably early hominins like the Australopiths have babies about every six years. But once hunting and gathering involved and we became bigger brained, the evidence is we probably increased the rate at which we started pumping out babies to every three years. That's a doubling of the rate at which we pumped babies out. I'm sorry for the crude expression. Um, but uh, at the same time, we, our children take longer to grow, right? So a, a chimpanzee takes about 12 or 13 years to grow. The same is true also of Australopiths like Lucy. But humans sort of take 18 years before we can grow. And this probably occurred uh, during this uh, genus, uh, the, 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 the evolution of archaic homo. And then the final transformation was the, was the evolution of our own species, Homo sapiens, which occurred sometime approximately 200, maybe a little bit older, 1,000 years ago. And the big thing about Homo sapiens really is, is above the neck, as I said before. And we have much more rounded brains, and our faces are small and retracted underneath our, our brain cases. So if, you, if you're a Neanderthal and you were so inclined to stick your finger through your orbit, right? It would go up into your brow ridge. But in a modern human, if you wanted to do that gross experiment, you'd actually plunge your finger into your forebrain, right? That's a very evocative way of understanding that our brains are, are basically above our faces, or our faces are retracted underneath our brains. This is a fundamental, profound difference between us and Neanderthals and other archaic humans. And why is that? Well, the evidence is that that shift in our heads was really about two different things. One is that there's a reorganization of our brains. So our brains are aren't any, any uh, larger than those of Neanderthals, but we have larger temporal lobes and larger parietal lobes and smaller occipital lobes, and there's fundamental shifts in the shape of our brains. But we also have different shaped pharynxes, the, the tube that runs through your head, which gives people the ability to have much more articulate speech, even if I am speaking too fast. And all of that, um, we can see that in the archaeological record, is when we get an explosion of cultural creativity. All of a sudden, things start to change faster and faster and faster. And there's been an acceleration of cultural change ever since modern humans evolved. So thanks to cultural evolution that was unleashed by the origins of modern humans and the invention of, of new ways of making tools and new ways of living and new kinds of food that we started to eat, humans started to spread around the world and we replaced other archaic humans that lived in other parts of the world. So we got into Europe by about 40,000 years ago, into Asia 50,000 years ago, into Australia by at least 40,000 years ago, and, and, uh, and other species disappeared. And then we ceased being hunter-gatherers altogether between the last five and 10,000 years, depending upon which part of the world. So agriculture was invented in at least seven different parts of the world. Um, and, um, and that was the end of the Paleolithic. And, but that doesn't mean evolution has stopped changing. In fact, it's been accelerating. The rate of cultural evolution continues to accelerate. Think of the changes that have occurred in our lifetime. You know, 10,000 years ago, the agricultural revolution. A few generations ago, the industrial revolution. A few years ago, the, the information revolution. These changes uh, continue to occur at accelerating rates. So 
that begs the question. So that's probably the fastest summary of human evolution that anybody will ever hear. And I want to spend the rest of the lecture thinking about what that means for us today. And one of the ways to ask that question is, has evolution stopped, right? Is it over, right? Is it now something different? Well, the answer to that is a resounding no, right? Uh, natural selection is the result of three phenomena. Her uh, variation, so I look around at you and I, all of you look a little bit different from each other, although you all look pretty similar, actually. Um, some of that variation is heritable, so you have genes that you inherited from your parents that make you different from each other. And then there's differential reproductive success. This is an experiment. How many of you, um, most of you look like your parents, so let's, let's talk about the parents. How many of you have one child? Okay. Bunch. How many of you had two children? How many of you have three children? How many of you have four children? Okay, a few. So look, there's variation in reproductive success in this room. Some of you have more, had more children than others of you. And if there are genetic variations that you had that made you had more children or fewer, that changes the frequency of genes in the next generation. Natural selection hasn't stopped. It's still going on, and you're proof of it right now, okay? But and when we know, actually, over the last few thousand years, there's been lots of kinds of evolution. For example, the ability to digest milk has, has evolved as an adult has evolved at least seven times in different populations. We've had in all kinds of evolution for, uh, to resist uh, infectious diseases such as malaria. We've had metabolic genes that help us tolerate diets, for example, high in, in carbohydrates. We've had changes in skin color. We recently published a, a, a paper in the journal Cell on, on another gene that affects um, how thick your hair is and, and things like that. Uh, there's lots of evolution that's still going on. So, and in fact, um, natural selection is still clearly a very important force for several reasons. One is that although uh, there's lots of culture out there that buffers us from natural selection. There's also more people out there. So there are more mutations that exist for natural selection to operate on. A few thousand years ago, there were less than a, you know, a million people on the planet. Now there are seven billion. Think of how many mutations. Every one of you in this room can has about a hundred unique mutations that nobody else in this room has. And about three or four of those mutations are actually expressed in your phenotype, the observable aspects of your body. That's, that's fodder for natural selection to occur. In addition, we're changing our environments rapidly, right? We're, through culture, we're creating new kinds of foods, new kinds of environments, new kinds of, 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 of situations that, um, that affect the, 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 the way in which those phenotypes um, yield more or less offspring. So, so we're just creating new kinds of selective pressures with the evolution of culture. So natural selection has not stopped. But even so, I think most of us in this room would agree that although natural selection is still important, cultural evolution is happening at such a rapid and profound and deep rate that it's beginning to swamp what natural selection does. Um, because um, after all, natural selection relies on, on mutation to occur, but cultural evolution can occur through intention. We can decide to invent things. We can, we, and we also don't transmit inf um, um, innovations just from parent to offspring, like this exchange, for example, right now is a form of cultural evolution where we're exchanging information horizontally just between, two diff between different individuals. There's so much rapid change that occurs through cultural evolution for so many more different reasons that it's enabling us to change our environments in an incredibly rapid way. And so, as a result, we need to think about some additional transformations that have occurred for our bodies. And one of them is the agricultural revolution, which really started about 600 generations ago. And the second is the industrial revolution, which has only occurred in the last few generations in most parts of the world, right? Started in the late 18th century in England and France. Um, in some parts of the world, it's really only just beginning to occur. And so we need to ask the question, how have these transformations also affected the human body? So just to very be very brief, the biggest change that occurred from the agricultural revolution, of course, is food. Farmers grow food, and so they have more food, and more food means more people, right? Because you can have more babies, and you can have them more often. Hunter-gatherers, as we said before, tend to have offspring every three years or so, but farmers can have them every two years, or sometimes even every one and a half years. That's a doubling, sometimes, of population growth rates. And so, since the invention of farming, the world's population went up by enormous, by several fold, enormous amount, of quite rapidly. But there are downsides to being a farmer. One of them is that the foods that we rely on that give us so much energy tend to be 
calorie rich but nutrient poor. So the cereals, um, you know, r rice, um, corn, um, 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 millet, um, those sorts of uh, cereals, um, are, which we can produce in large amounts, are not as nutritious as the kinds of foods that hunter-gatherers eat. In addition, it's actually slightly more work to be a farmer. Um, farmers have to work a little harder than hunter-gatherers. The average hunter-gatherer works about four to six hours a day. And what's really different is that farmers' children have to work. In fact, farmers have more children partly because they're creating their own force, their labor force. In fact, you know, the large families of farmers are kind of like a free form of you know, like slave labor almost, right, for, for, for parents, right? That's how farming works partly. Um, and then some of the other, uh, so, so farming children actually have to work much more than hunter-gatherer children wherever you look around the world. And then finally, farmers live in one place permanently and they have more people. So you have larger settlements with more people at higher population densities living uh, in, in, in the same place, accumulating filth, right? Um, they're, they're, the, the, you know, the, all, the, all the feces and all the other gross things that you can imagine that we produce, they're, they're there permanently in the villages that we live in. And so farmers have much more uh, disease and much more um, uh, from, from infectious diseases and diseases from, from reproductive, uh, you know, excuse me, um, uh, digestive tract diseases. Um, in addition, farmers are dependent more on the vagaries of of uh, the climate, right? So if there's a drought such as you're having here in California, it's not such a big deal because you can ship water in here and, you know, steal it from Utah or wherever you get your water here in, in California. And, and, you know, if that fails, you can still ship in food from some other part of the world. But in the old days, that meant, famine meant death. It was, um, it was quite serious and it still means that so in various parts of the world. So and that doesn't happen for hunter-gatherers because they're not so reliant on single staple crops. So with farming became much more disease and much more famine. So farming had some benefits, but it also had some serious costs. And those cost benefits started to change again really dramatically with the Industrial Revolution, which, which started, you know, just a few generations ago. <clears throat> and uh, what the Industrial Revolution is about, of course, is harnessing even more energy by burning fuels, essentially. And so that we have machines to do the work that was normally done either by humans or by animals. And that's enabled us to, uh, with more energy, to have exponentially more population growth. And so now, we're, instead of having millions of people on our graph, we have billions of people. And so, since the Industrial Revolution, the world's population has increased from about a billion to about seven billion people on the planet today. And they say by the end of the century, we could have as many as nine billion people. That's fundamentally made possible by energy. It's more energy, because energy, life really is about using energy to make more life. That's really the definition of life. So and industrialization has enabled us to harness sources of energy that were uh, before un impossible. Now at first, the Industrial Revolution actually brought more misery, right? Um, working hours were horrible. Um, there were pandemics of enormous proportion, the great plagues of cholera in London and, and, inf and influenza. Um, there was enormous pollution. There was very dangerous and hard work. Uh, so the, the, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, as we all know from the books of Dickens and, and Zola and others, who were, was a really kind of tough and miserable place in, 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 for a lot of people. But then things started to improve, right? For example, Pasteur, changed the world by figuring out microbes cause illness and, and inventing you know, pasteurization. The great sewers of the world started to be in, uh, constructed during the Industrial Revolution. It started in London because of the, the great stink. Uh, it was so bad they couldn't even meet in Parliament because the Thames was basically a giant sewer system that was killing people. We've invented panacea, uh, penicillin, excuse me, and other drugs that have, have been able to um, enable you know, people to survive infections that were killing people by the droves. But remember, a lot of those infectious diseases were diseases that were unleashed by the agricultural revolution. And so today, as a result of science and government and public health, today is really arguably the healthiest era ever in human evolution, right? We have a lot to be happy about. Just to give you, let's, so we can kind of feel good about ourselves, here's a, here's a few bits of data, right? So here's a comparison of infant mortality, the modal age of death, so modal means the most common age of death, once if people survived childhood, stature and population size in the world in the Paleolithic, the farming era, and the industrial era. And of course, I've taken some liberties to simplify because we're, we're taking vast amounts of time and simplifying them. But today, 
less than 1% of children in the, in, the, in, the, in the developed world die as infants. And that's unheard of for most of human evolutionary history. During the farming era and the Paleolithic era, it was probably 30 to 50 percent. This is, a, and we think it's normal for our children to grow up and become adults. Um, but that's, this is the first time in, ever in human evolutionary history that that's the case. Um, today, uh, people, if they survive childhood, and of course almost everybody does, can expect in places like the United States or other developed countries, can expect to live into their 70s or 80s. But in the era of farming, that was actually quite low. 40 to 50 years was what most people could expect to live to. Of course, a few people were fortunate to live to be older, but very few people lived beyond the age of 50. Uh, Hunter-gatherers actually um, have a wide range, depending on where you look, but hunter-gatherers actually, most of them, uh, if they survive childhood, actually live as long as people today here. Uh, in, in, and they'll actually live into their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Most of them become grandparents. Um, in the farming era, people became really short. Um, you know, Napoleon was actually not all that short for his time. We think of him as short today. But in the Paleolithic era, people were, were, were much taller than they were in the farming era. And, uh, and today, of course, we're slightly even taller than they, than they used to be in the, in the Paleolithic. And then finally, um, the world's population has swollen, right? There, are, there, are, there, are, there used to be only a few million people in the world, now there are billions of people in the world. So the world is doing very well. But we could be doing better. Uh, so even though it is the healthiest era to be a human being, we could be doing much better. And, uh, and the nub of the problem is really expressed by this, this slide. It's called the epidemiological transition. So if you look at the last few generations, there's been a decrease in the number of people who are dying from death and illness, you know, dying and, or getting sick from infectious diseases. How many of you in this room are worried about getting the plague? All right, very few of us, right? Smallpox, polio, these actually, there's a few of these diseases are, are, are actually creeping back a little bit, polio, but these are not concerns that most of us care about very much anymore. But what is rising are non-infectious chronic diseases, right? Heart disease is the number one killer of Americans today. Cancer, number two killer of people. Type 2 diabetes, one of the fastest rising diseases around the planet. Osteoporosis, allergies, the list is very long of chronic non-infectious diseases that afflict uh, human beings today. Um, and so this transition is really one of the great challenges of our generation, of our, of our world today. How do we de cope with these, these, this increase in chronic non-infectious diseases? So let's just, to get us all a little bit depressed, let's look at a few graphs. They're all the same, right? Uh, slopes going up. So for example, we all know that there's an increase in the percentage of people in the world today who are overweight and obese. In my lifetime, uh, percentage of obese Americans has tripled. Um, rates of other diseases, such as type 2 diabetes and breast cancer and Alzheimer's and osteoporosis, all of these diseases are becoming much more prevalent. This is a serious challenge that's bankrupting us, not to mention causing illness and, and uh, misery. Um, there's also some lesser diseases that are really common. Um, I'll make a bet that about a third of the people in this room, or maybe more, have myopia. About everybody, except maybe a few of the kids whose teeth were sealed, have cavities. Uh, flat feet. Uh, how many of you have flat feet? Yeah, about a third of you. Um, lower back pain, Alzheimer's, insomnia, depression, the list goes on. These are common ailments and concerns that we, uh, we all deal with. And, I, and there's an argument to be made that, that this epidemiological transition, in fact, the most common argument is that, well, this is the price of progress, right? We all have to die of something. And of course, more people are living lo longer and they're living to be older. Um, and so actually, we're in luck, right? Isn't it a good thing that we're going to die of cancer and heart disease rather than, at an old age rather than smallpox or polio or whatever at a young age. And, um, and to some extent that's true because some diseases do occur more frequently as you get older. Uh, some diseases like cancers, for example, occur because mutations accumulate and they are diseases that are more likely to occur people that get older. But we sometimes confuse diseases that occur in old age with greater frequency with diseases that are actually caused by getting older. That's an important distinction we often forget. Um, and, and, and actually, an evolutionary perspective helps us understand that this is an important distinction that we need to be more considerate of. And the argument is, and I did not make up this term, it's an important uh, term that's in the, in the evolutionary medicine literature, is that um, and evolutionary medicine is the field that applies um, evolutionary theory and data to health and disease which is that many of the diseases that people are confronting today are what we call mismatched diseases. 
And mismatched diseases are defined as diseases that are occurred because our bodies are inadequately or poorly adapted to the modern environments in which we now live. And you may think, okay, mismatched diseases, eh, not such a big deal. Well, maybe I can change your mind, right? Here is a hypothesized list of non, uh, non-infectious mismatched diseases. And it's a very long list. And by the way, I've left off all the horrible infectious diseases, which we know are caused by mismatch from living with animals in high population density. And in fact, the diseases that are most likely to kill us in this room are mismatched diseases. Heart disease, for example, the number one killer of Americans, um, is a disease that rarely, if ever, occurs among hunter-gatherers. These are modern, preventable diseases. Uh, many cancers are preventable. Actually, at least a third of cancers are preventable. Those are the two biggest killers of people in the United States. Cirrhosis, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, high blood pressure, these are all important mismatched diseases that are, um, are, are, um, um, all of us are probably concerned about. So that brings us back to the question of how it is that our culture is interacting with the biology that we inherited. And that begs the question, when we get these mismatched diseases, how do we respond to them? And one of my arguments um, I make in this book is that we've created a new dynamic. So as Zarai promised, I'll talk about being barefoot for a little bit, um, and, uh, and I'm a little bit obsessed by feet and by bare feet, so bear with me here. I've got a foot fetish, I guess. Um, but we know that humans evolved to be barefoot, right? Um, uh, shoes are a very recent invention, probably the last, maybe the oldest shoes were maybe 40,000 years old, and they were probably very simple, like sandals or moccasins, right? And really, for millions of years before that, everybody was barefoot. There was, were no shoes on the planet, right? So our bodies are adapted to be either barefoot or very minimally shod, right? But what we've done is we've created fancy, schmancy, comfortable shoes, right? They've got all kinds of features, like cushioned heels and arch supports or, or these sexy red shoes or whatever, for various reasons we, uh, we like. We find them attractive or beautiful or, or comfortable. And um, although there are many benefits to these shoes, I'm not opposed to shoes, believe me, I'm wearing shoes, see? But, um, but they do cause some problems, and one of them is they cause flat feet. So f- flat feet are a mismatched disease. I work in populations in the world that people don't wear shoes, and I can tell you almost none of them have flat feet. It's almost non-existent among barefoot populations. So we get, and and that's partly because shoes uh, make our feet weak, and so the muscles in the arch don't function properly, and either we don't develop an arch or our arch collapses. It's a very common uh, phenomenon. So what do we do when you have a flat foot? You go to the podiatrist, who gives you a orthotic, which treats the symptoms of the flat foot, doesn't cure it, it just simply treats the symptoms and enables you to tolerate and deal with the flat foot so you continue to wear the shoes that you want to wear, which means that we continue to get flat feet. And we've created a vicious circle of dependency. By not treating the symptoms, excuse me, by treating the symptoms rather than the causes of diseases, we perpetuate a vicious cycle. And my hypothesis is that this vicious cycle, which I call dis-evolution, dis for bad, evolution for um, for change over time, is a major dynamic that's underlying this, this epidemiological transition that we're experiencing. So I'll give you another example, because I also work on skulls, right? So we drink food that's extremely th- uh, processed. or you, know, you could actually spend your whole day and never have to chew anything, right? You could just have stuff that comes out of straws, right? And never chew anything. All, you could actually spend your whole life never chewing, right? But it turns out that you're your jaw requires mechanical loading, you know, forces, just like every other bone in your body. And your, your jaws actually don't grow as long if you don't eat hard, tough food. Uh, as an example, chimpanzees spend half their day chewing. Um, half their day, they've actually got food in their mouth chewing, right? And how much of, what percentage of your day do you spend chewing? Probably 1% less. Hunter-gatherers spend about 5% of their day chewing, and they chew much harder foods. So by softening our food, we actually, our jaws don't grow large enough for our teeth to fit in. So we get malocclusions and impacted wisdom teeth, and we have to go to the orthodontist to take some out and, you know, get braces and all that kind of stuff, and we keep that cycle going. It's not a form of biological evolution. Natural selection is not really going on. It's a form of cultural evolution that's affecting our bodies. So there are several characteristics of these diseases that I think we can pay attention to. One is that all of these diseases are caused by interactions between the genes that we inherited and the environments that we've created. They're gene-environment interactions. But these are diseases in which environments have recently changed, 
not the genes. There's no gene for third molar impactions that swept, or flat feet that swept through our populations, right? It's that we're wearing shoes and eating soft food that are causing these problems. Secondly, most of these problems are caused by environmental stimuli that are hard to, per to perceive. You know, each time you wear a shoe, you don't feel your feet collapsing. Or you're, each time you eat, drink a smoothie, you don't feel your, your jaw not growing, right? You can barely perceive the effects. You don't even or understand that they're, that they're related to the, 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 the cause and the, and the effect are even related to each other. They're, or they're often difficult to prevent, uh, like cavities are caused by eating starchy foods. We can't stop eating starchy foods. We, the world would, the world would, would, would die. We'd, everybody would be horrible famines, right? So, the, so we can't. So they're complex environmental causes. Third, most of these diseases don't have much effect on our reproductive success. Flat feet, for example. I mean, who doesn't mate because they have flat feet? <laughs> Probably unlikely. Um, myopia, another mismatched disease. I mean, I think people with glasses are kind of sexy. I don't know. Um, and then finally, all of these, these diseases involve trade-offs, right? There are benefits to all these things. Shoes, uh, carbohydrates, um, reading, all these things have benefits that, uh, that sometimes outweigh the costs. And they're not necessarily, it's not simply a good thing versus a bad thing. It's a complicated thing. So let's look at the evolutionary roots of three kinds of this in interaction between the bodies we inherited and the environments uh, that we uh, have created. And I, would, I think that a w great way of dividing up these interactions, to think about environmental changes that are result in too much of a stimulus, too little of a stimulus, or stimuli that are completely novel. Right, so this is my taxonomy. So let's start with too much. I hope that's a Photoshopped photo. I don't know. Found it on the web. OK. So let's talk about energy, having too much energy. So as I mentioned before, I think one of the really important transformations that occurred in human evolution occurred around 2 million years ago, when the origins of the genus Homo occurred. And one of the things that happened at that time is that we started to increase brain size. This is the graph of time before the present, and this is the size of the brain. And you can see there was a big shift that started around 2 million years ago. People's brains started getting bigger. Now, brains are wonderful things, but most animals don't have big brains because there are costs associated with brains. Brains are very expensive. Uh, those of you sitting here listening to me are using about 20% of your brain, 20% uh, of your body's basic energetic rate, you know, what's called the resting metabolic rate, just paying for your brain right now. And if you're not listening to me, you're still spending about 20% of your <laughs> metabolic rate just paying for your brain. When you're asleep, you spend about 20% of your body's me me metabolism just paying for your brain. Brains are thirstily tissues that relentlessly need energy, and they need it even when you're not thinking. And you, but your brains don't store energy. Brains rely on energy supplies that come from the rest of the body. So brains are very costly. So in order to have bigger brains, we needed to have, um, we needed to have more energy. We also shifted our life history, as I mentioned before. As I, as I, uh, you know, uh, our ancestors had offspring every six years, but we figured out how to double the rate at which we reproduce and have offspring every three years. That's a, that's a big energetic shift. You need to have twice as much energy in order to do that. We also spend much more time growing our offspring. Here's, here's Prince William when he was 12 years old. I think that's Prince William, right? And um, at that age, if he were a chimpanzee, he'd be a full-grown, reproducing male chimpanzee. But as a 12-year-old as a teenager, he's still got a long time to go before he can ever have children, right? So we've actually increased the amount of time it takes to grow our offspring before they can start having um, children. And that's more energy. It takes more energy to grow a human up to be a reproductive uh, adult. That's, that's, that's energy. It's all about energy. And how did we get that energy? Well, as I said before, it came from this marvelous system that was invented around two million years ago called hunting and gathering, in which we combine a number of elements. It's not just one thing. It's many things. So one of them is tool making. And there's actually a wonderful exhibit back there, uh, the Zerai's exhibit, that shows you some of the oldest tools and the importance of tool making and human evolution. We started processing our food with those tools, which, are, which increases the amount of energy you can get from your food. We started hunting. We started running. I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk about running today for those of you, but I'm happy to talk about it later on. But running was important. It was necessary for people to be able to hunt because we didn't have weaponry back then. We started to throw. We started to have a division of labor and intense cooperation. And all of this gives us more high energy foods, particularly carbohydrates and fat. So hunter gatherers could get honey and underground storage organs and meat, all of which were able to fuel this reproductive um, uh, shift, which was made possible by more energy. Energy was the key thing here. 
Now that ability to get energy from, from what we eat was transformed again with the origins of agriculture. Once we started growing food, we were able to, around, which only started around 600 generations ago. Just to give you perspective, 600 generations ago is the amount of t number of generations of dogs that have come and gone since the time of Christ. It's also the number of generations of mice that have lived in my basement since the house was built about 100 years ago. It's not that much time in evolutionary history. It's a blink of an eye. But in those 600 generations, we've been able to get huge amounts of energy from carbohydrate-rich foods. In the last 10 generations or so, we've been able to turn you know, corn into sugar and grow you know, huge numbers of, of animals for, for, for consumption through industrial farming technology. So let's give some examples. One of them is sugar. So in the Paleolithic, uh, average hunter-gatherer might get about four to eight pounds of sugar a year. The average American today gets about 100 pounds of added sugar to their food um, because we, sugar was actually the first industrialized crop. We, it's now so cheap, we don't know what to do with most of it. Um, and along with the sugar um, has been an inverse shift in fiber. The average hunter-gatherer gets about 80 pounds a year of fiber. That may sound really disgusting. But actually, what's even more disgusting is they're only getting about 12 pounds of fiber per year. And that's the US RDA, by the way. So we actually have decreased the amount of fiber in our diets enormously. Now, why does that matter? Well, because processed, that's basically the essence of processed foods, in which we remove fiber from our foods and add sugar. We also add salt and fat, etc. And those cause metabolic diseases. So for example, sugar has two basic forms that we get most of our sugar from. One is glucose, that's basically starch, and the other is fructose, which is the really sweet part of sugar. So a cube of, of sugar is half glucose and half fructose, and, and your body deals with them differently. Glucose uh, is dealt with in your bloodstream by insulin. So when you eat a meal and it's got uh, starch, your blood glucose level rises. And that's a, in a way it's good, right? It pays for your brain, it pays for all your tissues, but but too much sugar in your blood is poisonous. So your body has to get it out of there. And so insulin levels rise, and insulin levels rise in order to get that glucose out of your blood um, and into your, um, into your fat cells and into your muscle cells and various other cells. The problem is that if you eat food that is full of, uh, it's devoid of fiber and full of sugar, you get an overshot in your insulin levels. It's what's called a high glycemic food. And then you would then have an under, then you become hypoglycemic. You have too little blood sugar and actually makes you hungrier faster and earlier and you end up eating more. And then you end up with all that insulin. What insulin does is that insulin shuttles all that glucose into your fat cells and makes you, well, fatter, right? Now fructose is dealt with by your liver and, when you, and the liver can only burn so much fructose at a time. So if you have, and, and fiber slows the rate at which not only glucose gets into your bloodstream, but also fructose gets into your liver. And so when you get too much fructose too fast, your liver can't handle it, can't burn it, so it has to turn the rest into fat. And the rest of that fat either makes your liver fat, which is what it sounds like, and then also sends that fat out into your body in lipoproteins, what's called bad cholesterol, which then makes, gives you high levels of belly fat and high levels of cholesterol and high blood pressure and high levels of blood sugar and ultimately gives us metabolic syndrome. So the combination of too much sugar with, in the absence of fiber gives us a wide variety of problems. An example of these problems is type 2 diabetes. So diabetes is caused by an interaction, again, between genes and environment, right? And what, we do, and what happens is that um, when, um, when you um, get um, a, a large amount of, of, of abdominal fat, belly fat, that causes uh, insulin resistance. So the, an insulin resistance occurs when the cells in your body, um, so you need, you need insulin to tell glucose to be transported into your cells. So here's a, what happens is insulin binds to those cells and then it allows glucose to go into your cells okay, from out of your bloodstream. When you get too much um, um, inflammation in your body, the, the insulin receptors become insensitive to insulin. So now the insulin can't bind um, so that it can't bring the glu glucose in. And what happens is that your blood sugar level rises. And as your blood sugar level rises, your pancreas senses that, senses that secretes more insulin, and then, and then eventually you get this vicious circle where you have higher levels of blood sugar, more insulin, and eventually what happens is that the pancreas gives up. It can't produce the insulin anymore, and then you cease to be able to produce insulin, and then you get type 2 diabetes, and you need, you need injections of insulin. So how do we deal with it? Well, this is where we get to disevolution. Well, there's two major ways of dealing with it. One is medication, 
and the other is exercise and diet. And what medication does, it doesn't cure anybody of type 2 diabetes, it helps us mitigate the symptoms. There's nothing wrong with that. People who are sick need, need help, right? But, um, but with exercise and diet, you can actually prevent and actually reverse the disease. There are experiments which put people on you know, very low calorie diets or high exercise regimes and they actually recover their insulin sensitivity from ins insulin insensitive cells. So I would argue that the way in which we uh, uh, get and treat type 2 diabetes is an example of disevolution. Remember, we're, these are diseases that are caused by interactions between our genes and our environments, and this is indeed a gene-environment interaction. The causes are incremental and not obvious. Every time you have a, a glass of orange juice in the morning, you probably don't think, okay, here comes you know, diabetes on the way, right? But, but actually, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's sugar in the absence of fiber. And, and you, keep, you keep doing it, 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 it keeps adding up. Most people who get the disease don't get it until their 50s or their 60s. So it has little if no effect on reproduction. And then finally, there's a complex trade-off between the costs and the benefits that make this disease possible in the first place. So I'd argue, I would argue that the reason that type 2 diabetes levels are rising around the world is a classic example of this kind of disevolutionary feedback loop. All right, now that we're all really kind of cheered up, let's go to another uh, source. Well, let's think about disevolution from too little of a stimulus. And now we'll, you're going to really hate me, but we're going to talk about exercise. <laughs> so um, every system in your body needs stress. And by stress, I mean um, when you actually have to make a physiological system work a little bit harder, right? And a perfect example is exercise and the effects on muscles, right? So you, we all know that no pain, no gain, right? You have, to, you have to use your muscles in order for your muscles to grow. Right? Um, and, f and, th and that is an ancient adaptation because it allows capacity to match demand. Muscles are even more expensive than brains. So you're sitting here, I, none of you really seem to be using your muscles very much, except those of you who are, you know, gesticulating. I'm the one who's gesticulating. But muscles actually are cost most of us in this room about 40% of our metabolism. They're really expensive, right? So, and if you're living at the margin of energy balance, if you're a hunter-gatherer and you don't have that much energy, you don't want any more muscle than you need because that's excess energy that you can't devote towards reproduction, which is what natural selection really cares about. So you only want as, an, as much muscle as you actually need, which is why we don't gain muscle unless we actually need it. That's why you need to exercise to develop muscles. And it's also why if you don't use muscles, you lose them, like the governor, former governor of California, right? Prevents costly overcapacity, although it's a little bit humiliating. So physical activity, it turns out to be important for almost every system of your body. In fact, probably is important for every system of your body. It affects your heart. It affects your, your, your vascular system. It affects your, your cells. It affects your, um, your metabolism. It affects your immune system and your brain. There's, I can't, I mean, we could give, you know, an entire semester of lectures on the importance of physical activity for various systems of your body. Um, but this is not coincidental because, as I mentioned before, humans evolved to be athletes. You know, your typical apes, from which you know, our closest relatives, you know, the maximum they travel every day is about two to three kilometers. That's what chimpanzees do. Gorillas travel even less, maybe a kilometer a day. Gibbons, orangs, barely travel in a, in a day. But your average hunter-gatherer female, in all over the world, the worldwide average is that an average hunter-gatherer female travels nine kilometers a day. The average hunter-gatherer male travels 15 kilometers to the, every day. And there's no Sabbath, there's no bank holiday, there's no retirement. This is what you do your whole life. To put that into perspective, nine kilometers a day is basically walking from Washington, D.C. to California every year. That's what all of our ancestors did every year of their lives for all of human evolution until extremely recently. Um, we also evolved to run long distances in order to hunt, and we evolved to climb and to dig. And of course, when we're carrying food, when we're walking long distances, we're carrying children. There are no strollers in the Paleolithic. We also carried, we had to carry food back to camp. So humans evolved to be athletes, but I think most of our athletic abilities are endurance rather than power. We are fundamentally endurance athletes. And we can measure what the effects of the Industrial Revolution has been on our activity levels through a very simple measure called the Physical Activity Level, or the PAL. Now, it's just a simple ratio of the total amount of energy that you're using on a given day divided by the amount of energy that you might use if you basically spend it in bed with a remote control. All right, you know, basically doing nothing, okay? So it's, it's basically the, the, the ratio of the energy you use versus the energy that you, that you need just to maintain your body. 
And um, so we know from extensive uh, studies of hunter-gatherers, including very sophisticated ones, that the average hunter-gatherer physical activity level is about 1.9. So they basically spend about as much energy doing stuff as they spend energy taking care of their bodies. We also know that farmers, most subsistence farmers, work just a little bit harder than hunter-gatherers, so the children have to work a lot harder. So there, there, there's a slight increase with farming. But since the industrial era, and particularly with post-industrial era, that the PALs have, sh have, have declined precipitously. So the average PAL in the United States is about 1.5. Most of us in this room only about spend about 50% of our resting metabolic energy actually doing stuff. That's about a 20% reduction. If you think about that in actual calorie terms, that, um, uh, let's, let's give an example. Here's the one I kind of love. Uh, so it turns out that in the early industrial era, of course, the sewing machine was invented. My grandmother had one of these Singer sewing machines with a pedal. I remember she loved using that sewing machine. And, um, and people have actually you know, put you know, measurement devices on, on, on people like my grandmother and measured how much energy they spend using a sewing machine. It's actually about 98 calories an hour. Now, uh, here's the mayor of London demonstrating an electric sewing machine. Actually, I don't think he's actually using it. He looks like he's desperate for help here. <clears throat> and uh, if he were sewing, actually, he'd be spending about 73 calories an hour. You think, okay, big deal. It's 15 calories an hour. That's like three Tic Tacs. Big deal, right? Um, that's a 15% reduction, but let's do the math, right? If you do that, if you have a union job, right? So you're only doing it eight hours a day, and you're doing it five days a week, and you get vacations, so you're doing it 50 weeks a year. You know what the difference is in terms of calories expended? It's 52,000 calories a year. And that's enough to run 18 marathons. That's just by putting an a, a machine, an electric motor on a sewing machine. Now add in elevators and escalators and shopping carts and, and uh, cars and you know, strollers and all those other things that we have in our environment. We even have motors in our toothbrushes so we don't have to move our hands when we, when we brush our teeth, right? We, we, have, we, have, we have motorized absolutely everything. And so there's been a drastic reduction in the amount of energy that we expend today, which is why our physical activity levels have plummeted. So what does that mean? A 15% reduction in physical activity levels is about 300 to 500 calories a day. That's a, it's a, silly, it's a silly illustration, but actually that's a dramatic change in our body's environment. A 300 to 500 calorie a day change in how much energy you spend in your daily life is a fascinating, huge, enormous shift in the environments that our bodies experience. And one of the insidious effects of that is osteoporosis, right? Which is a disease that is rising rapidly throughout the world. It afflicts more than 30% of women over the age of 50. It's now inflicting at least 10% of men over the age of 50. And it's very rare uh, in subsistence, non-subsistence populations. And that's because applied forces not only affect muscles and they affect your immune system, they affect your bones. So for example, if you were to look at a professional tennis player, you know, Rafael Nadal, he's got the same genes on the left and the right side of his body, but his arms, his bones are much thicker thicker uh, in his racket arm, his left side, than in his right arm because he keeps whacking a tennis ball with that arm, right? And those bones, those, those forces actually cause his bones to grow thicker. Again, that's that principle of no strain, no gain, right? You need to use things to develop more capacity. <clears throat> and the trade-off is that, uh, but bones are costly to grow. So when individuals use their bones a lot, they grow more, but when they don't use them, we lose them because we never evolved in, in, in circumstances where people didn't have to have excess capacity. So if you go to space or you spend a lot of time in bed or whatever, you lose bone or you never even develop it in the first place. And the result is that we, have, we run into an ancient constraint, which is that all of us grow our skeleton when we're young and we achieve peak bone mass between the ages of about 20 to 30. That's it. You can't grow any more bone in your body after the age of about 30. That's it. I'm sorry. I see a few of you who are still a few more years to grow. So go keep playing tennis or whatever because you want to be up here. Now what happens is that individuals who are more active when they're young achieve a higher peak bone mass. But people who are less active when they're young achieve lower peak bone mass. And then all of us start losing bone. And women, unfortunately, start losing bone at a faster rate because of menopause because the loss of estrogen has an effect on the rate of bone loss. And so what happens is that people who develop less peak bone mass are much more likely to fall behold that, below that threshold for osteoporosis to occur. So I would argue that this is yet another example of disevolution, but this is an example of disevolution from too little of a former stimulus, in this case, physical activity, right? It's a gene-environment interaction in which um, and genes haven't changed so much, but our environments have shifted dramatically, as I've just explained.
And each time you take the elevator or the, or the, or the escalator, it's an incremental, non-obvious effect on your, on your body. Um, and most people who get osteoporosis don't get it until they're, they're grandparents, so it has no effect on their reproduction. And then finally, there's no question that th there are many benefits to all these labor-saving devices, and many of us believe that the benefits um, may outweigh the costs, so that, that's arguable. So it's another example of this sort of feedback loop of, of, and, of uh, what we do is we treat the symptoms of the disease, but we're not treating the causes of the disease. And by the way, there are other factors as well, calcium and vitamin D, but I'm going to ignore those because physical activity seems to be the most important. So finally, since we're all really, really depressed now, let's talk about something, uh, the third category, which is things that are too new. Now, it's obvious that there's a lot of new things in our environment that, that you know, we never had before. DDT and cars and cigarettes and bungee jumping. I don't know why anybody ever wants to bungee jump. My wife really wants to do it, and I've forbidden her. Uh, she's forbidden me from doing other things reciprocally, so don't worry. It's, not a, it's an equal forbidding relationship. Um, but let's take something a little bit more benign. Here's a nice gentleman right here. He looks like just, you, we all want to be like this guy or have him, you know, in our family tree, right? Here he is reading the paper and he's wearing nice shoes and he's sitting on a chair and he's reading the paper. It's like a perfect little scene, right? We all admire this fellow and want to be like this guy, right? Except everything this guy is doing is killers, right? All of these things are bad for you. And let me give an example and we'll take one that I think try, I'll try to surprise you and that's reading, okay? Now, reading, you think, okay, what's, what's bad about reading? But remember, reading is actually a very novel thing. You know, the first people only read about 5,000 years ago when writing was first invented. And, and it got a little bit of a boost when Gutenberg and printing was invented. But really, universal literacy didn't start occurring until the 19th century, when, when the hordes and the masses, you know, started to be able to read. And the first evidence of its effects on our bodies actually came in England. And if you've been to St. James Palace in London but near Pall Mall, well, that's where the Queen's Guard is, is, has happened. And the, and, the, and the physician to the Queen's Guard was a guy named James Ware. And he noticed that lots of the officers in the Queen's Guard had myopia. They, had, they were nearsighted. But none of the foot soldiers had myopia. Um, as he said, among the Queen's Guard officers, many were myopic, while the 10,000 foot guards, less than a half dozen were myopic. And we've had, there have been expeditions by optometrists and ophthalmologists and various other ologists of various sorts who've gone out and measured in hunter-gatherer groups and subsistence farmers, and myopia is almost non-existent in these populations, less than 3%. It's, a, it's at least 30% in the United States. In some countries in the world, it's as high as 50%. Now, what is going on, right? Well, myopia is caused by having an eyeball that's too long. That's really basically all that causes it. So what happens is that when you... Pres Look at the world normally, right? If you have a normal eyeball, your lens and uh, your cornea and then your lens focuses that light just perfectly on the back of your eyeball, on the retina where the sensing cells are. But if your eyeball is too long, you can't actually focus more than the lens can flatten. You can only flatten your lens so much. And so the, 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 the image falls short of the retina and the world, so things that are close up are always blurry. You can't ever see anything close up. Now, there's been a vigorous debate. You think that paleoanthropologists get mad at each other? Wait till you see the ophthalmologists fight, right? And there's two big arguments about what causes myopia. And um, this is still a debate. But one argument, it's probably, they're probably both true, but one argument is that close work causes it. So what happens? When you look at things up close, you actually have to fire all these muscles. So the, 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 there are little muscles that suspend your lens. They're called the ciliary muscles. And those muscles attached to filaments that actually are around the lens. They're like a trampoline. Those filaments, by the way, for those of you uh, like trivia, are known as the zonules of zin. Got to get like that. So, um, the zonules of zin are these filaments that s suspend your eye, and the ciliary muscles actually act to slacken those zonules. So when you look up at something really close, those, fil those cilia s contract, which slacken the zonules, which enable the eyeball to flatten out so you can read things close by, but those ciliary muscles are muscles. What do muscles do? They contract. When muscles contract, they produce force, and those forces actually increase the pressure inside the eyeball. When you increase the pressure inside a balloon, what happens to the balloon? It expands. Same thing in an eyeball, but the eyeball can't really expand in the front because it's got this you know, lens and stuff in the front. can't really expand in the back, so it gets longer from front to back. And there's actually evidence that, that this, this contraction can have some effects. But it turns out that's not the only explanation. So people who read a lot right, are more likely to become myopic. People who do close work 
microscopes, tailors, you know, people like that. But it turns out there were some gruesome experiments that were done by the famous Nobel laureate uh, Hubel and Weisel who worked on how the brain uh, exp experiences vision. And they sewed the eyeballs of some cats shut for various complex reasons. But uh, on one side they sewed the eyeball shut and the other side they didn't. And this was to understand the evolution of vision. And they just happened to notice one day that the, that the eyeball on the, show, on the side that was sewed shut were longer. And these cats had never read anything. In fact, they'd never looked at anything with those eyeballs. And it turns out there's another cause of myopia, which is that visual stimuli sensed by the retina actually regulate and inhibit eyeball growth. And so if you, you can actually do these experiments where they put like blurry, they put like glasses on chicks and mice that make the world blurry, and guess what? Their eyeballs grow too long. And you put animals in rooms with lack of intense visual stimuli, their eyeballs grow longer. You put human beings in, in rooms with lack, with, you know, without all the bright lights of the outside world, and guess what? Their eyeballs grow longer. It turns out that independent of reading, spending less time outdoors is highly and significantly correlated with increases in myopia. So I would argue that we again have another example of disevolution, right? In this case, from, a, from too little, right? So there's a gene-environment interaction. There are genes that make some people more susceptible to myopia than others, but the increase in myopia over the last few generations is not caused by these genes sweeping around the planet causing myopia. It's caused by changes in our environment. Each time you spend you know, a few hours indoors or looking at your computer, at your book, you're not, the cause is incremental and non-obvious. It has little effect or no effect on reproduction. In fact, you could argue that people with glasses are kind of sexy, right? And then finally, there's no question, most of us are not going to prevent our children from reading because we all agree that reading is really good for people. But here, the benefits clearly outweigh the causes. So here we've got another example of disevolution. So what are our solutions? Maybe we can design you know, get kids to play outside more. I think all of us agree that's a good thing. And maybe we can get books that, that are more visually dynamic and have more bright lights inside, and maybe that might help us uh, deal with myopia. So finally, now that we're all thoroughly uh, depressed, let's think about, again, this evolutionary question, right? How can we use evolutionary logic, an evolutionary perspective, to help us chart a better future for the human body? Remember, the epidemiological transition in which there's been a decrease in infectious diseases, but there's been an increase in non-infectious chronic diseases. Just to give you some facts on the problem, 75% of the diseases that people suffer from in the United States, when people walk into a doctor's office, 75% of the time, according to the CDC, those diseases are preventable. Furthermore, just to further depress us, we spend now 19% of our GDP on healthcare. Now, part of that's because of the crazy system we have for healthcare, but part of that is we're spending a lot of time taking care of people who, are, who shouldn't be sick. And it turns out that although we spend about less than 5%, probably actually more close to 3% of our entire healthcare budget, including research from the NIH on prevention. And even so, so about medical care only explains, explains about 10% of the health outcomes in the United States. So we're spending 20% of our entire budget explaining less than 10% of the outcome and health on people and for, for, for preventable diseases. This is a crazy system, right? We're all, we all agree with that. So the question is, can an evolutionary perspective help us get these chronic non-infectious diseases down? What can we do? Well, here are our options, right? So one of them is to do nothing. Let's just let natural selection solve the problem. I hope all of you agree this is not an acceptable solution, right? First of all, it will take hundreds if not thousands of generations if it occurs at all. It's not going to help us, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. It's not the right thing to do. We, it's, we're not gonna, we can't wait around for, for natural selection to solve the problem for us. What we do mostly is invest in treatment and educating people, and I'm all in favor of that. We, people who are sick and ill, they need and deserve health care. We need to help people who are, who, are, who are struggling. And we also need to educate people so they can better use their bodies and make better choices and not smoke and, and you know, eat healthy foods and be physically active and all those sorts of things are important. Um, and as a professor, as an educator, I believe passionately in these things. But finally, I think the, what, edu what evolution tells us is that we also need to change our environments, right? And I think this is where the evolutionary perspective is very important. Because like it or not, all of us in this room 
our ancestors evolved to be bipedal, slightly fat creatures, right? Um, primates tend to have about 5% body fat. Even the thinnest, you know, hunter-gatherer females have about 15 to 20% body fat. We're a fat species compared to other things. We're furless, we're big-brained, we're tool-using. But in terms of our diets, we evolved to eat a high-fiber, low-carb diet, but we to, to crave sugar, starch, and fat. We evolved to be very physically active, but to take it easy whenever possible. If you put escalators in the Kalahari Desert, I promise you the hunter-gatherers would be taking them, right? There's, it's normal, it's natural, it's, it's, it's instinctive, right? So this is what we evolved to be, but we're now asked to make choices that we never evolved to make. If we were to get in a time machine and go back a few million years ago, to a, 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 this is a Homo erectus family that uh, in, the, in, in the museum in Jakarta in Indonesia. And if we were able to listen in on the family, I'll make a bet that that mother was not telling her kid, you know, don't forget to eat the healthy food and don't forget to exercise. There was no choice. Of course she had to eat healthy food and exercise. There was no other way to live, right? But today we have to, we have to um, ask, we have to, for, we have to uh, overcome all kinds of instincts to eat cookies and take elevators in order to, to live healthy lifestyles. So we get these mismatched diseases again because we have these old genes which we can't change, but we have modern environments, novel environments, some of which cause mismatched diseases, and we can change those environments. But right now, the big problem to changing those environments is that it's really a political problem, right? Because we have two major options. Uh, in addition to education, which is to coerce people, which many people are averse to, right? Force people not to, not to eat fats and force them to be physically active and et cetera, or, or use nudges like taxes or, 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 or begging them to use the soda ban uh, stairs or, or Michael Bloomberg's, you know, whether you agree with it or not, I don't know, but you know, whether he tried to ban the 32 ounce you know, big gulps in New York City, right? Um, but I, it's interesting we're having these debates, but the one, group for which we don't have these debates are children, right? We all agree that, you know, that, um, that, that, that seatbelt laws were a good thing. We, you know, it saves a lot of lives. We, we now coerce parents and children to wear seatbelts. We now require our kids to go to school. Um, should we require immunizations? We have a rising tide of, of diseases that are current coming back because parents are choosing not to immunize their children, I think very foolishly. Maybe we should require, I believe we should require physical activity, much education, much more seriously in schools than we're doing. We also ban things. We don't let children smoke or drink. That's not controversial, right? What about junk food? Um, it's, it's not actually, I mean, you know, it's not as bad or as fast as drinking and smoking, but too much junk food is definitely harmful for our children. Should we, should we, should we legislate? Should we, should, we, should, we, um, should we control those? So I hope I've convinced you that evolution still matters. Um, we, we, we will not get out of this problem without understanding it, and we will not understand it unless we remember that everything in biology, including medicine, makes sense in the light of evolution. So. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for um, listening to this horrible lecture.